Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the course on flanging IOLs and secondary IOL fixation simplified. So we are going to start with uh, Professor Keki Mehta who has been past president of AIOS and past scientific chairman with his modified dumbbelling technique. Let's start. I'm happy to see uh, an audience is still there with us. I expected even this would be still thinner considering the fact that in another hour, we are going to have a GBM where we are going to announce some very interesting results. Having said that, I am going to talk to you today on a prolid-based, double-based scleral fixation of secondary implants. I am going to show you two techniques. One is the standard Canabrava modified technique for fixation of subluxated lenses. Now the question is the Canabrava technique essentially uses prolid as loops with flanging, as you are aware. The question is, what is the modification which I have done? Now, what we have done is that rather than putting the two ends of an implant anchors, I have altered it by fixing roughly in the middle of the lens itself, which prevents spiraling or spinning. This supports the implant and the advantage is that the insertion locks enable you to get a better result post-operative. Having said that, let me start off. Yamane was the one who made the original entry points. That is why I'm going to show it to you. Let also. me show it to you. Uh, First, let me show you the bag. Uh, and can the we lens. stop the sound, please? This is as it was. If you noticed, no sound. The lens. Bag, if you notice the bag is moving. Lens. Everything there is really shaking. no way you can fix it. There's no a way you can point suture this point bag anywhere. Everything is going to drop. The answer is simple. So we so start off by it. doing a small conjunctiva being lifted. A small conjunctival flap is and being lifted. And exposing a little of the sclera on both sides. sides. This is because the area where you are going to be putting your proline loops and a little should be empty. Cautery is then so that the conjunctiva can subsequently cover it. Completely. To remove any Do a little cautery, prepare it and leave it at that. Now mark the next step using your... A marker. Squint marker, that's the usual Set one it I to use. Three millimeters. Yeah, just so that you can one get and a half square millimeters three on millimeter both sides. Incision. Two marks. This one gives you horizontally zone through which one vertical. You'll be able to insert same, your horizontally needles. and vertically. Vertically so from the opposite can, side. As one would say, bury the entire. The vertical points are from where I'm going to enter planted. subsequently. I and always you prefer to use an AC maintainer. maintainer. The maintainer is to keep the chamber to handle. Now here you prepare the Yamane using tunnel, a 27 just gauge using needle. a needle, you prepare the Yamane tunnels. Making two tunnels on down the lines. So just later on you can use, the use these tunnels to insert your Now we loops. need to remove and that the locks lens the, and the bag. locks it into place. We remove first the IOL the first and subsequently and as you notice the bag. After the IOL, you notice the bag just simply comes The bag follows suit. It really in other words, no support really the bag had no support with your iris in. At this point, you can cut off your infusion and you will notice that the, the air bubble is the iris goes back. Inserted. Insert an air bubble, very important. And that a single stitch that the is chamber is soft enough. And, and you put a single cross stitch. Closed. Why a cross stitch at this stage? Bending because final it's a safety stitch. You never leave a chamber open. One fine day you will get in trouble. So whenever you open a chamber, even if you're going to be inserting an IOL later, which I'm going to be, we you utilize put a five zero proline. Now we take proline. The standard really available proline blue color proline, Ethi Prime five zero, and and you thread, thread it, it into, into a twenty seven gauge needle, making sure that an adequate amount is threaded in. Threaded on both sides, so the needle the suture goes in. Now you at this stage you enter through the tunnel you have your made. Tunnel. And Turn it an horizontally chamber. and insert and it pull the thread out. Similarly, on this the other side, done from enter both horizontally sides. and then uh, through the tunnel, insert it. So that is to make now sure that even later on, loops of there's the no way that proline knobs can slip in. Now comes the now interesting, the interesting part. part. You, you take a rubber bung, on a rubber black bag rubber bung, and punch on which I put an implant. A hole with the 27 and make a needle. hole at the base through the where this at the lens junction. fixates. This is a standard lens. You lift up the needle and the lens the galaxy lens made by together with. Really no problem, but any lens will work equally well. 
and penetrate it with two needles. Now, into that same now, needle when which you, you have punched, up, you the read that 27 gauge as a haptic junction, you into feel the needles. Five zero protein. The same the gauge same with protein, same needles, you have same which you had in protein, you had pulled out from the, the middle of the eye. Now, and now when you push, push the lens, lens forward, forward, it gets transferred and it will automatically roll on, on the protein, stabilizing it. It's a very simple method. You then now the ends of the loop, you flange the them. A low temperature Essentially, quadri, use a low temperature and create a ball and apply it. So you and find a form a nice solid bone. round bump. This acts After as doing your that, pull it and make sure that it doesn't come out. Huh? Tug it for your implant. If it comes out, put it through and make a bigger uh, protein loop. Make That's sure important that the stage. Loops then are not all you have over. to do is you take your lens, making sure your in, loops in are not crossed over. The lens lies and insert your lens inside. No gymnastics, when the nothing being done forward. inside the eye, no hand that over hand, fist over fist. Any ruling of the lens. Purely simply put the lens in, the and as you apply a little traction at the sides, you will find that the lens will subsequently the side in position. In suture three. Again, the same rules what apply as I told you earlier. You open the, the eye, close the eye first. Always do this as a regular routine, which closes it. And you close it with a single or a double cross. Now you utilize. Now you form a little ball of protein. Hold quadric, the base. Create put a ball. Tight, hold the base. So that and let the ball. Both form ends are stable on both sides. Adjust it in place. At this stage, your lens is locked in position. You do a little core vitrectomy on top, utilizing an anterior vitrectomy. And you can apply a little and steroid to make sure that it is all correct. And then use a, a coaptation cautery on both sides. Bury the knobs and you bury the knob on both sides. So your knob is buried. Eye is stable. Thank you for watching. Nothing else. Simple will be way of doing a good procedure. That is a simple way of doing a protein suture. However, a problem still occurs. Even with this two-point fixation which I have shown you, still, if you examine your patient over a period of time, the lens tends to spiral or rotate. It is not exactly horizontal as you want it. So I thought to myself, how can I manage to get out of that? So I developed another method to get supported. Now to do that, I need to take a silicone plate and using this little instrument, which is nothing more than something you use to punch holes in your belt with. And you punch out utilizing 2.5 millimeter openings of a silicone plate. The same silicone plate, one millimeter in thickness, which is used for oculoplasty surgery. Those little plates I'm going to put on top of the lens and then support it with a proline, which enables it to make sure that there should be no problems. A new disc dumbbelling technique for secondary eye oil. This I call as the disc it dumbbelling technique. It's not been described before. So you're seeing something for the first time tended to spindle and were no longer very stable in the eye. In an effort to eliminate that, we started a new technique. Now the whole idea behind it is technique. that Let me as we did with the last one, we start off again. We start off with the, the standard initial steps remain of identical. Pi zero proline, pi zero proline into, gauge into a 27 gauge needle, needle and pull it out. Before we insert it into the eye. Cut off the edges and then and AC make in a little side port, a port and the inferior part for your IA maintainer. Very important. Otherwise, everything tends to go helter skelter. Now, in the a similar manner, are inserted you insert inside, your and the proline is, is gradually suture. removed. I mean, insert your needle inside by holding it and push the suture out. Hold the suture and pull it out. And no gymnastics. You don't have to enter in the eye to do. Hand over hand, fist over fist. This is one of the simplest Once ways you go in there the again, suture. you go inside, hold the end of the suture and put it out. So you got two of these sutures, into which I'm now having to going to fixate here you two now things: have two the lens the and the dumbbell which I have made. You now take the protein. Make, make sure, sure they are not crossed cross over. over. That's important. And this was your lens. 
in a similar manner to the what I have already shown you. But here opera. you go through the edge of the opera lens. Opera. Not through the middle, not making a new opening. Just go through the end of the lenses. Rather than switching This is basically a, just a Rayner, Rayner style which lens then, which is being used. Very often now you feed it and into a suture, lens. into a needle on which the dumbbell which has been made. You remember I showed you a little dumbbell which you are going to make out of that. So Pumps. this has only been punched out utilizing as I said the little punch and then auto you create it's a one a millimeter sheet knob. from a one millimeter sure. sheet and then that you of course you flange the end so that you now have the lens and, hold and you have this dumbbell sitting on top make sure it is secure pull it and make sure it is tight both sides. it must not come out later on if it comes out later on it is a big nuisance. Thread the bung onto the needle and then subsequently thread the suture same way the suture the which was inside the eye is fed on, on top of it and the dumbbell is taken on top and the lens is fed in Create a little knob at the end, and then you sure you use you your the, knob, the bunk properly. I love the background music. Now the bunk has to be down. Flange it, making lens. sure it sits well. Let me show you. Now, if you notice, manner. this is the lens, but when we and there are two dumbbells behind, on both sides. The bunk will go behind. Feed in one edge of it, one dumbbell and one First side of the lens. Put in the bung. Then you feed in the other and side, put in the other edge of the lens. The lens. Feed the, the last bung over it. Once you go inside, you pull it. Pull it into place. When you pull it, Gradually the dumbbell sit it. on the surface of the so lens, the bung lie stabilizing it from the back side. So that the lens is stable lens and held. Literally the horizontal plate. The slight edge of the bung, but then now you flange the ends and, ends you use your and bring it into proper condition. Create a little knob to anchor it into place. And we close. Then you subsequently close the wound with a single cross stitch. The eye up. With either a single suture or a double cross stitch suture. I normally like to use a double cross stitch and, and close it because whether you put one or two, it makes very little difference, but it must be totally secure. As you notice, the lens is totally stable. Once it is placed with the bung below it, it literally stabilizes the lens. The quality of very it subsequently and that is, is it. better. Then, then subsequently, the all you have to take is a cunning dapper which you open up with the side, the cover up your proline parts, and you that is it. So these are simple you. methods you which I hope you enjoy and you can utilize in your own practice. Thank you. Good, it's lovely to have background saying Jai Ho. Okay, put my presentation up. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, and shut my audio because we have enough audio from there. So this is our subluxated lenses and flanging lenses course. Uh, since everybody else is busy in Rangachari, uh, I think I'm going to take some more time. Let's go through three, four different clinical scenarios. So this person was lying in a hotel by the swimming pool and a mango fell on her eye. That's why I made this video called Mango Season. When anybody gets hit on the eye or anything happens and they go to the GP, they always get Ziploc. At least in Maharashtra and Goa area, anything happens, GP puts Ziploc in the eye. So she puts Ziploc for a few days and realized vision is not improving and then comes for a consultation. On presentation, IOP was about 50 with a clear cornea, mid-dilated pupil, and the lens luxating into the anterior chamber. So I gave her mannitol IV and oral diamox, waited for the IOP to drop somewhat, and then we start the case. So let's have a look at this. So this kind of scenario, we always keep a emmet segment ready, a ring segment, uh, keep an anchor, keep different sutures, everything ready, and always the ubiquitous CTR. So you need the biggest CTR that you can have to give the bag 
stability and to start this kind of case you can see the whole lens is a little mobile but there's not like one particular area from which it is totally subluxated so it's like a general zonular laxity due to the blunt trauma so you make a nice small smallish rexis about 5 mm and then you open your little armamentarium of capsule hooks you always wonder i used to always wonder why there were four hooks uh, was it uh, with their five hooks uh, was it that if you drop one you have one extra but not really the five hooks are actually used to suspend the capsular bag like this so if you have a good rexis which is paramount in this kind of scenario otherwise you cannot do this maneuver your capsular bag is now uh, completely stable and you can see it is transfixed so it's not going to move at all you can do your faco maneuvers you have to go a little slow you can't use 700 vacuum otherwise the bag might flop off and again you do a gentle irrigation aspiration this is important because you don't want to dislodge the capsular bag from its uh, hold from the hooks because if you dislodge the bag then getting the hooks back may be difficult so you slowly slowly peel the cortex from the periphery to the center using low vacuum and low parameters and now it's time to inject the capsule tension ring so preloaded rings this was an imported ring about this was videos about 4 5 years old but now you get them from many indian companies and these preloaded polypropylene rings are very very nice uh, and they go and they make pmma as well so this is a particularly a pmma ring from a company called oftech which goes in like butter that's very important it will never snag the capsular bag and in goes the iol i tuck the iol into the bag and see is it sitting nice and stable and surely enough it is and this patient still comes for follow ups at any sign of zonular laxity i will think about passing a suture through the haptics and fixing fixing it to the sclera but not now so far everything seems to be good so when you have a case of gross subluxation not like this you have uh, 90 to 180 degrees totally subluxated you have you can either use a ring segment or you can use a fixation device like an asia anchor which was invented by ehud asia and it's in its second generation now the first generation that i'm going to show you was uniplanar and the third uh, second one is three dimensional like a paper clip so let's have a look at this video now should we use capsule hooks or uh, simply stop drop anchor audio. when required in the case of so basically what should we do in this kind of scenario if you have access to a femtosecond laser now is the time to deploy it instead of using the femto to do grade 1 cataracts which is just pointless you have to use it for situations like this you get a perfect punched out rexis like this and to get a rexis like this is rather difficult to get every time by hand so in this kind of scenario this works well use helon or sodium hyaluronate to make some space there and then put capsule hooks capsule hooks are different from iris hooks because the capsule hooks are uh, broader at the end and they are blunt so it won't hurt the the capsular bag at all that's your ring segment so you pass one end of a double arm proline and railroad one end out of the eye and then railroad the other end so you have a two point fixation like this in order to hold the ring segment properly this is all rather simple maneuvers get the ring segment and you can see the capsular tension ring as well there so you always put a capsular tension ring along with the ring segment so what do you do if you have a poor axis what happens when the femto doesn't work or the subluxation is so extreme that it exceeds the parameters of the femto system like this so it made some punctures in the cortex but it didn't make any capsular axis because it just couldn't compute it so in this kind of situation you are stuck doing it manually most of the time it does work out but this time it didn't so take it around and now the axis has tried to run away despite frequently putting viscoelastic in the eye so i managed to keep a axis but it's gone to the periphery so the equator of the human lens is involved in the capsular axis in this kind of situation you don't have enough rim for the capsular segment to hold itself in it will just pop out of the bag so you take out your double arm proline again and this is an anchor which looks like an anchor that you throw from a boat to keep it stabilized in the sea so it has two legs at the end 
and those two legs are what we are going to use to entrap the periphery of the capsular bag. So railroad the suture out of the eye and keep your anchor in there to give some kind of stability in case the capsular bag looks like it's going to fold over once you take out the cortex. Luckily this didn't happen. So the capsular bag was quite stable in this case. After doing an IA, I create a new posterior capsular bag by pulling the anchor with its two trailing legs which has enmeshed itself in that periphery. Pass the suture twice through the sclera. So you need only one pass. You don't need a double arm. You can do a double arm but I think this is just easier. You pass one suture after tying it and then pass it twice through the sclera. It locks it. So now you've generated a, a decent usable capsular bag. And now you can put your IOL in there. When you inject it, see that you don't just inject it quickly inside. Otherwise it will jump open and it hits that anchor and the anchor loses its hold on the capsule. It will just fold over and become very complicated. So this was the end of the procedure and this case ended well. So let's have a look at another unique case where I had to flange a lens. So this person, somebody had operated them and uh, obviously had a, a PC rent. And then he put the PC lens which was uh, a three-piece foldable with uh, polypropylene haptics uh, in the anterior chamber. And this remained there for years together when he came to me a totally decompensated cornea. The record showed that after that he went to a retina specialist who then did, there was probably some fragments in the vitreous and he did a 3 PPV. So now you had an eye with no vitreous, no capsule and the PC lens in the AC. So in this kind of situation, we have to get the lens out because the cornea is totally packed up. And then after that, we have to plan a desec. But a desec we can only do when there's a lens behind to hold the air bubble. So first we have to flange a IOL and then do a desec. So let's see how this went. So first step, we know that we're going to do a desec and get that out. So you need a nice big tunnel, about five and a half millimeters. So you do a scleral tunnel and get that IOL out that has been living there in the anterior chamber. Already vitrectomy has been done, so I can just put an AC maintainer rather than a posterior port. One and a half to two millimeters, you measure, and then load up the needle just as you saw in the last few videos. Put the needle in. Then go through the main tunnel. After shutting off the infusion, otherwise the iris jumps out and then get one end out. At the same time, you prepare that graft and get it ready. So flanging a lens like this is rather straightforward. Since we have a big opening, I might as well just use a PMMA lens with eyelets, which makes it nice and simple. So you pass those through, uh, two sutures through the eyelets of the PMMA lens. And this is the trailing haptic where you're passing it. And remember that the flange has to be uh, inferiorly to hold it. So that's the whole complex. You pop it into the eye and then use your low temperature cautery. Now second part of the surgery. And that's your graft getting in the eye. Now you close all the openings and make it absolutely airtight and then float it up. So DSEC is a simple surgery to learn. Especially if you get pre-cut pre grafts it's rather simple. It looks very complicated, but it's not. You can see videos and you can just do it yourself. Put all the sutures, make sure that air bubble stays and this patient still comes back with pretty good vision. He's about 6 by 12. And this is the final situation that I wanted to share with you all since we have lots of time and no other speakers. Uh, it's pediatric cataract with persistent fetal vasculature. So all of us who did MS in the 90s would know this as persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous where the hyaloid artery and sometimes tunica vasculosa lentis is left behind. Post-97 it became PFV or persistent fetal vasculature and you have eyes with anterior PFV and posterior PFV and then you have eyes with both of them. When you get a small baby with a unilateral cataract, you must understand that 90% of the time this child is going to have PFV. 
So if you prepare only for cataract surgery and don't do a B scan and other posterior investigations, you'll get blindsided when you remove the cortex and you realize that there's a hole in the posterior capsule or there's a plaque there or there are fetal remnants. So expect some persistent fetal remnants in unilateral pediatric cataract. Let's have a look at the video. So the baby was referred to us from the Middle East with all the investigations done. B-scan, IOL power calculation, everything. So that's what it looks like. And you can see that the posterior capsule plaque. So first thing is that you put in a pot about 2 millimeters behind. Because once you do the cataract surgery, the eye will be so soft in an infant, you won't be able to get that pot in. Use the side pot and do a nice, slow, controlled rexis with lots of viscoelastic. You don't want that rexis running out. Just suck out the lens matter. And lo and behold, what we predicted was there, there's a posterior capsule punched out opening. So we already know this, that this was going to be there because 9 out of 10 times, this is going to be the scenario with a posterior capsule plaque. So in goes the IOL. And the IOL tamponades this opening. And this opening is quite stable and doesn't show any signs of extending to the periphery. And you can see part of the plaque on the side. So let's go to the vitrectomy part of it. That's, that's the B scan showing the posterior hyaloid artery and multiple echoes there. So we have to clear all this off. Luckily for us, posterior hyaloid artery didn't bleed at all. The artery inside it regressed and there was only a fetal remnants left there. So we could just do a vitrectomy and get it out. So these are the few situations that I wanted to share with you. So we have to give the haul by 3.30 for the GBM. So if you have any questions, since we have no more speakers, this is a good time. I think if we have uh, no questions, we can wind up the course because they need the hall to organize the seating and all for the GBM at 4 o'clock. So thank you everyone and we'll see you next year in Calcutta.